this, this is just, uh, again, a, 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 while I'm just giving you a little bit of an overview, you can watch this. This is from the Rim of Fire, uh, uh, some of the volcanoes that are dominated by mussels and shrimp. And the mussels themselves all are making a living with endosymbiont. So they actually have a decreased gut and they have microbes that are actually oxidizing hydrogen sulfide and producing the uh, carbon needed. And a ton of the shrimp are feeding sometimes off of the microbial biofilm that grows on the shells of the mussels and yeah. anywhere else. So, but it's a very unusual to see in the deep sea that, that kind of uh, dominance. And I thought I'd show you one other weird organism which is appropriate before dinner, which is, <laughs> it, it is how a shrimp can actually avoid being eaten uh, by a fish by actually vomiting out a luminescent. Uh, so this is, this is kind of a cool strategy. I'm, I'm trying to get that genetically engineered into me. And I don't, uh, you know, so it hasn't happened yet, but there, there's hope. So going back to the origins and to continue on what I was going to talk about, I just thought I would summarize a little bit, again, the abbreviated history. And I've talked about Darwin, Oparin, Haldane, uh, the emergence of the RNA world. Uh, some of the other, uh, in the 1980s, uh, the late Leslie Argel was very much into uh, the RNA uh, world and really believed that RNA not only preceded, but actually led the metabolism. So it's very, very different from the metabolism people. Freeman Dyson actually has a very different kind of view. Uh, you know, as, as a non-biologist, you can see non-biologists think about origin of life also. Uh, that ATP produced, and, and which is the high energy compound, was produced and consumed by protein. So it was a protein-based organisms first that actually led the RNA. Uh, uh, in, in his system. And Kaufman, who is noted for his sort of autocatalytic sets, and he's written a number of papers on the origin of life, that's really built on Freeman Dyson's idea, but includes a wide range of other metabolites and polymers, so that you had that kind of a network, a recirculating network, before you actually had uh, RNA. And then I think the, the, the metabolic reaction <clears throat> and the metabolism first really came about in, in the really amazing set of papers that came out in the late 1980s and uh, early 1990s by Günther Wechterhäuser. And, and he was the first to really uh, model the origin of life uh, primarily based on pyrites and hydrothermal vent conditions. And as a result of his work, there's been actually some uh, uh, experimental evidence showing that part of what Vector Heuser talked about can actually happen. George Cody at the Carnegie Ge Geophysical Institute has been working on this for quite some time. And Eschemoser, uh, who's an organic chemist, has also done some of this kind of work. And so I'm going to kind of develop those ideas a little bit. And uh, what I'd like to do today and, and tomorrow is deal with the sort of bottom-up approach and talk about organic chemistry uh, and some of the reactions that are used to make the organic chemistry that we like. And then the replicator first idea, uh, and the reason is RNA is the perfect molecule because it's both a chicken and the egg at the same time. It, it does both things. And then talk about metabolism first and this idea of sparseness versus the soup. Why is it better to actually have fewer organic compounds than lots? And then is metabolism needed to synthesize RNA? So that's, so we've shown this already, the top-down approach. I won't go, go into it, but the pathway leading to life as we think it happens is, again, organic material somewhere. It's condensed and, and polymerized to actually make the large macromolecules. Uh, from that came RNA, protein, and proto-metabolism, uh, and eventually the genetic code, ribosomes. Those are all unknown as, as to how that happens, but and, and that's potentially the first living entity. Uh, the unity of biochemistry I talked about. At some point, all of these different origin of life experiments, there would be Darwinian selection, the fittest genes and, uh, for biochemistry, uh, and that would happen before the separation of the three domains. Then eventually a transition from RNA to DNA. 
uh, and the three domains of life and the origin of eukaryotes. Now, I actually have my own theory about the origin of the eukaryotes that I may or may not talk about when I talk about them, that I actually think the origin of eukaryotes came out of the RNA world. And the reason it has multiple chromosomes, et cetera, is that it started out as an RNA type of, of organism. But that's another story. So the bottom-up approach, the five broad topics that we can actually talk about are the sources of organic precursors to life and what causes chirality, why all the amino acids are L's and all the sugars are D's. When, when we synthesize them abiotically, they're usually 50-50. Uh, the synthesis of, we actually have a, somebody who's actually doing some work on this here in the audience that I've had a chat with. Uh, so there's synthesis of biopolymers. How do you do that? How do you go from simple organic compounds to more complex? And then, of course, we mentioned metabolism and replicator, the origin of nucleic acid, genetic code. I'll say a little bit about that. Uh, and then the settings, which is what I hope to end this set, set of talks with. So <clears throat> there's a lot of ways to make organic material. This is why I always say that just going on first principles or even being more of an Occam's razor type person, if there's going to be life anywhere in the universe, if possible, it's going to involve organic carbon. That's just too prevalent. And there's too many ways to make it. So there's a lot of ways that organic co uh, compounds can actually enter Earth from uh, dust particles, comets, uh, shock synthesis, all of this has been demonstrated and, and, and lightning. But there's also a lot of mechanisms within the Earth's crust and perhaps even deeper down in the mantle, as we know, since graphite and diamonds are made. But there's, there must be a lot of different ways in which we can make carbon. And in a lot of ways, we're just starting to, for example, in this what I call peridotite hosted hydrothermal system, that was just discovered in 2000. We have learned so much about the abiotic synthesis of organic carbon just from that site than, than probably in the previous 20, 30 years of, of research on other hydrothermal systems. And you'll get a whole lecture from me on this peridotite hosted system because that's my workplace. That's where I go. So. so, you know, back to the building blocks. Uh, you've seen the, the Stanley Miller first experiment, but note that these are all uh, the amino acids here that are actually es essential. And one of the simplest amino acids, glycine and, and, and alanine, are the most dominant made. There's a lot of essential amino acids that are not made by this me mechanism, uh, including some that uh, we really believe were very early on in the, in the history of the genetic code. Uh, to go on to the genetic code, which is a three-base code, it's, it's capable of, of taking care of uh, or recognizing all the 20 plus amino acids. But we really believe in the origin of code. It may have been a two-base code to start out with, with uh, a potential of up to about 16 amino acids, but probably fewer. And so there's a, a real interest in what those minimum uh, amino acids would have been like. And if we look at carbonaceous meteorites, and this has been talked about, a lot of the key building blocks have already been found, not necessarily like they are in life, but amino acids, fatty acids, purines, pyrimidines that are part of RNA and DNA, uh, sugars, et cetera, have been, except ribose is not. In fact, this ribose issue is really important, and we'll get back to it. Uh, it is so important that it almost destroyed the RNA world concept because no one knew how to make a five carbon sugar. And a lot of organic chemists were saying, okay, it wasn't ribose. It didn't start out. RNA did not have ribose. It had something else. And I mentioned Echimoser, but others have constructed all these really interesting potential sugars that they can make under abiotic condition that might actually do the same thing, but none of them ever really worked completely. And it's only in, in, a, in a, a few years ago that ribose was being able to synthesize in fairly high numbers. So what do you do with these organic compounds? And if you're just going to do strict organic chemistry, for the most part, you're, you are really interested in 
a couple of really uh, small organic compounds that have a lot of catalytic potential. And one is cyanide, which is a, 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 an HC triple bond N, and formaldehyde, a single, a symbol, uh, uh, one carbon uh, aldehyde. B both of these are extremely uh, reactive. And so there's a reaction <coughs> called the Formos reaction, for example, where using these catalysts, you can make purines, um, pyrimidines, uh, potentially you know, simple sugars, amino acids. However, the yield of what you want is extremely low. Uh, it's one of the problems with these. And also, to run the foremost reaction, it, there are steps, if you're an organic chemist, there are steps to do these reactions that are under conditions that have never existed on Earth. So a lot of these reactions that are being done to, to make these are done under conditions that probably never, never happened on Earth. Uh, but they're cool and it keeps organic chemists really busy. And this is why I mentioned that you know, Steve Benner when he made the comment that you know, RNA really does not like water because they can't do anything. They don't know how to make it in water. But it wasn't made in, it, unless, you know, and, and, unless uh, uh, you know, Jonathan is, is right, maybe RNA was first made on Titan. And we actually had little pools of Titan on Earth at some point that we don't even know existed. So the reactions that produce water and soluble products also, like hydrocarbons, uh, have been done. We've actually seen these. The word amphiphile is really long ch uh, uh, chain fatty acids that can actually have a polar uh, 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 end that can actually spontaneously uh, uh, form uh, what looks like a little bit of membranes, and I'll show you that. And then the polymerization reactions <clears throat> are the least understood. Uh, generally, for example, if you take amino acids and you have uh, dry heat, uh, wet dry cycle, and particularly on clays, you can make some peptide, peptides on that. The same thing with, with forming uh, uh, nucleic acids. They've made polyuracil to some extent, again, on a wet dry cycle on clays. Uh, and so uh, all of us are very interested in, for example, minerals and w when, you know, w under what conditions the earth can have a wet dry cycle. And that's why I like the, uh, the concept that the, uh, the last heavy bombardment actually m may have been this kind of wet dry cycle system that allowed polymerization to go on. That's uh, one component of this that I, I kind of like. So the big gap we know how to synthesize many of the organic compounds required for life, but we know little about how to incorporate these compounds into useful macromolecules. Uh, our ability to make large macromolecules are, is really def very deficient. So while it is generally believed the RNA preceded DNA, we don't know if it can be synthesized under environmental conditions in contrast to how we can synthesize something in the laboratory. We're still very much not knowing that. So the two competing models for the origin of life I mentioned is replicator first and metabolism first. Both models involve encapsulation into small cell-like structures, and this is why there's a lot of interest in uh, the various hydrocarbons that can form these. So Shapiro actually favors a, a metabolism first model, but he's come up with a, a little diagram. Uh, <laughs> His model also starts with an organic soup of some kind, except that the organic compounds are incorporated into compartments that have a better chance, he thinks, of developing into a network of autocatalytic cycles, eventually into an information macromolecule, as opposed to the replicator first that, again, says paternostophilia spiritus santus, and you got a replicator, a star life right away. As we just don't know the step leading to that at all. Uh, and then. Uh, from, from that. So this is, this is all cool, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense uh, right now to me, either one of these, even though I can lean a little bit towards metabolism first, but I'll, I'll try to explain to you why. The Shapiro builds on an idea first discussed again by Freeman Dyson and summarized in one of his famous quotes, life began with little bags, the precursors of the cell, and closing small volumes of dirty water containing miscellaneous garbage. So this is 
This is how physicists think. <laughs> anyway, it's descriptive. So the replicator first model predicts that RNA preceded DNA protein and metabolism. This, <clears throat> this is the central dogma of molecular biology as we know it. Molecular biologists are religious, and so the, uh, Francis Crick actually coined this the central dogma. Uh, so it's, it's basically uh, DNA makes RNA, which makes protein, and there's a feedback loop that you need protein for DNA replication and RNA replication. In the RNA world, you have an RNA that, as I say, works as a chicken in the egg. It doesn't initially need protein because it can catalyze its own replication. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that's the, the basis, and then eventually it made protein, and you actually had a life form that was just RNA working both like DNA and RNA and, make, and, and transcribing into protein. So the RNA world, which I say is a very compelling model on a lot of different levels, is the all-purpose molecule. And the reason it, it emerged as the all-purpose particle, a particle, because they found some in bacteria that <clears throat> We, we've already, always knew that they were templates for chemical systems and information storage, but Keck and his associates found some RNA in cells that were self-splicing. That is, they can actually uh, take sections of, off the RNA and put them somewhere else. So they have this ability to essentially jump uh, genetic material from one RNA to another. Uh, they were also in some ways self-reproducing, but not completely. So they can actually reproduce part of the RNA sequence. And of course, they can make peptides. And because of this early, this early work of, of catalysis, that you actually have a, an RNA acting like a protein enzyme and an information molecule, that the RNA world became the, the dominant new paradigm for thinking about uh, how life started. So RNA combines the genotype, which is the genetic information, with the phenotype, which is the expression of the, of the genetic information. So self-replication then per, uh, permits Darwinian evolution. So the goal was to understand how a protein-free RNA world became established on the primitive Earth. And this led to the molecular biologist's dream, which I'll come to later. <clears throat> which is something that Leslie Orgel, I think, dreamt of all, probably every night of his life uh, before he passed away. For those of you not familiar with it, this is uh, an RNA molecule of various uh, nitrogenous bases that make up the, uh, the RNA molecule. There's four of them. It's distinctive in RNA because they have uracil, whereas in DNA has thymine. Uh, <clears throat> This is usually depicted as a single-stranded in RNA, but there are viruses that are double-stranded RNA, so we know double-stranded RNA can also happen. Uh, and the ribosome that Jim talked a little bit about it, I'll point out that <coughs> while it's both RNA and proteins, and so while it has, uh, in brown, it has four major RNA molecules, it also has more than 50 proteins depending on where the ribosome comes from. And these proteins are a couple of things. They're very much involved in, in uh, uh, the process of translating RNA into, into proteins. Uh, and I'll show you later that all of the proteins that have been looked at associated with the ribosome are very, very ancient proteins and highly preserved in all three domains. So this is a typical ribozyme. This is one of the first to be isolated. It's called ribonuclease P. And this is the molecule that won a Nobel Prize. Uh, and <clears throat> it functions both as a, an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. In other words, it can also cause, uh, uh, be involved in its own po possible self-replication by acting also like an enzyme. So it can make copies of part of the RNA from an, its RNA template, requires an RNA template and RNA primer. It's very much like the polymerase uh, chain reaction, that you, you have to have a primer which is part of this sequence, and then you have all the components, 
and then you can actually make, make this, uh, all the components of nucleotides. So it can make an RNA molecule. Unfortunately, that's only 14 bases long. So more work is needed on this. So it's not making a big piece of RNA, it's making a small piece, but it can do it. So the recent research I've just kind of summarized is that ribose and nucleotides now have been synthesized abiotically. And this, is a, this was a big, uh, a, a big thing to find, uh, be able to, to synthesize ribose. And the trick to synthesizing ribose was using a mineral borate. So it's a boron mineral that actually helps to catalyze the, the formation of ribose. The polymerization of nucleotides by uh, RNA has now been up to about 50 bases. So we're getting really close to being able to, uh, you know, to, to make, uh, make larger uh, uh, nucleotides. Uh, a lot of this work is done at, uh, by Ferris at the Rheinsler U uh, University using clays. It's also been synthesized in a water ice uh, a mixture and in lipid bilayer lattices. Still needed is an RNA polymerase ribozyme capable of self-replication. That's the sort of gold standard that we're looking for, is an RNA molecule that can replicate itself completely. And then insight on the emergence of the RNA code, we don't really know very much about that. Uh, this is, uh, to me, one of the most exciting areas of, of research, but we're a long way from understanding it, and that's the origin and evolution of the ribosome. I'll give you my prejudice right now is that the RNA world doesn't exist as everybody thinks it does. And if an RNA world exists, it came about along with protein or peptides initially, uh, simultaneously. And what you actually had was a proto-ribosome world. You never had an RNA world. You had a proto-ribosome world. And maybe later on I can talk about that. Then, of course, linking metabolism and replication in a compartment, the emergence of a cell. So the molecular biologist dream, this is Orgel's, and I, I don't know when he actually did this, but I've heard him say this twice now. And he's passed away in, in 2008, and so I thought, in commemoration of one of the brightest people I've ever known in my life, I thought I would tell you about how he dreams, so that you know how scientists dream. First, the formation of precursors to nucleic acids, blah, 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 we need that. Next. Nucleotides were formed from prebiotic bases, and nucleotides mean that they have the sugars and phosphate, and they accumulated in some special environment. Next, a mineral catalyst, like clays, then catalyzed the formation of long chains. Polynucleotides, some of which were converted to complementary double strands by template-directed synthesis. This resulted in a library of double-stranded RNA in the primitive Earth. So what he likes to see is, let's say, the whole ocean of Earth, just nothing but double-stranded RNAs everywhere. In fact, so many of them that they can actually touch each other and combine and do all sorts of wonderful things. Next, among the double-stranded RNAs, there's at least one that on melting yields a single-stranded ribozyme capable of copying itself. So that's... This dream is what is, is also a very clear description of what people doing research in the RNA world are, 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 is, is actually doing. Each one of these steps is current research. So, so far, some of the outstanding problems with the RNA world, again, source of the precursors to RNA. Uh, we now, uh, as a result of a paper in two, Science 2004 and a couple of papers since then, uh, Steve Benner is also an author of this that ribose was synthesized uh, in the presence of boron minerals. <clears throat> Some of you don't go uh, probably back far enough when Ronald Reagan was doing ad advertisements for borax on uh, uh, some TV program, but Steve Benner generally, when he describes this, he has a, his first picture is a picture of, of Ronald Reagan with this 20 mule team team pulling borax out down from the mountain. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, uh, it, so at least at least uh, uh, Ronald Reagan gets associated with the origin of life, which is probably not a bad thing. You know? uh, so anyway, uh, again, abiotic synthesis of RNA from precursors, we haven't done that yet. 
the transition from an RNA to a self-replicating RNA hasn't happened yet. The transition from a self-replicating RNA to genetic code, et cetera. All of these just haven't been done yet. So th there are a lot of problems, and it was hoping since the 1980s that we would be further ahead on this topic. So the next topic, and I think, as I mentioned, both uh, many of the people involved in, in uh, metabolism first, and certainly all the people involved in the RNA world want encapsulation. In other words, they want all of these reactions to take place in some kind of a structure that looks like a cell. And <clears throat> typically what happens, I mentioned these amphiphiles that have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And these are actually formed easily abiotically and they also, uh, uh, there's a lot of ways to make them. And they self-assemble into these micelles because of, of the direction of the, the hydrophobic tail uh, and the hydrophobic head on the outside. And they form a linear uh, polymer first and then as they get bigger, they circularize and then become more of a three-dimensional sphere. And so you can actually get these cell looking like structures. Dave Deemer now at the University of Santa Cruz has been doing a lot of this work for a number of years going back into the 1990s. And so this is what some of these uh, uh, lipid membranes kind of look like showing the, the, the hydrophilic polar end uh, which attract water and, and the outside uh, t uh, on the outside and, and then the, and the inside the, uh, the tails. And these lipid compounds self-assemble into these bilayer structures. So what David is, this is what they look like if you make them. So what, what uh, Dave has actually done, for example, if he takes these uh, lipid spheres and he puts, let's say, RNA around them, and then he puts them into a dry cycle, they collapse. And upon, uh, into these little layers of collapsed uh, <clears throat> kind of membranes and in between the RNA. And then he rehydrates and a, quite, a, quite a high percent then actually encapsulate the, the DNA, so this is or, or the RNA. So this is a way to actually take a sphere like this and actually get things and, and put them in it. And so David's world, or Dave's world, is again an abiotic synthesis, probably something more like a, a soup, and that you, you make these, these vesicles and these films and then uh, these complex uh, molecular aggregates, and then they get, uh, eventually you make you know, monomers, including uh, both high energy type of compounds and nucleic acids, et cetera, that get incorporated to this. And so the first, so in this, this case, encapsulation of this material, like he described, was the first uh, cellular life. There's a lot of gaps in this because <clears throat> What you're doing is saying, you know, if you can make these, uh, these sort of artificial membranes, but then everything you add to them, you, you haven't made abiotically. They're, you make them in the lab and then, and then you find a way to pull them together. And, and that's a lot of it, the direction it's going into. Just to show you more, this is a 10th micron bar, show you what these uh, artificial vesicle membranes look like. Uh, and if you look at them under a microscope, I mean, they look a lot like cells. I mean, they're, they're really interesting. They even have complex edges to them. Uh, and, and so, you know, a number of people are working with these. And probably the, some of the most interesting work being done is done by, by Jack Shostak. Uh, and Jack, as some of you know, won the Nobel Prize last year, not for this work, but for some earlier work. So his idea is to take the, the kind of membrane re replicating vesicle systems that uh, Dave Deemer has and <clears throat> try to put a nucleic acid inside of them and, and see if he can get those nucleic acids to reproduce inside of these uh, so he can add all the nucleotide bases, et cetera. And he's looking for mechanisms to, to get these to, to grow. And so in a, uh, 
typically what happens when you add these uh, hydrocarbons to it um, and they form these spheres as you keep adding more and more which of these uh, hydrocarbons to it, it forms these uh, more filamental uh, out, out, outcrops that look like this and that these aggregate ar around into small circles again and eventually grow into large ones. So he has this sort of reproductive system based on a budding mechanism. It's interesting that you know a lot of living organisms replicate this way. A lot of yeast, for example, replicate by budding. Um, and so he has this kind of... so. Uh, so it has, essentially he's getting some kind of, 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 of growth uh, and it leads, leads to division into daughter vesicles which in turn can grow and repeat the cycle. So he's demonstrated that this cycle can go on. Uh, another experiment that he's done is, is that he's added DNA uh, strands uh, labeled with uh, uh, dyes and when annealed to each other, they, they, they fluoresce. So he can actually see when it is single and when it is double. Uh, and then following strand separation and re-kneeling, the donor and quencher uh, are, are separated, resulting in a high fluorescence signal. So what essentially he does is he takes double-stranded DNA, heats them, and then they come apart, as you do with heat, because the DNA, is, is, the double strands are held by hydrogen bonds and as you uh, add uh, temperature increases the hydrogen bonds break and they go into single strands and a hypothermophile microorganism for example presents, tries to prevent that by adding more salt so the more salt you have the higher the temperature it takes to actually uh, break it apart so he, he was able to actually do a heat cool cycle, which is exactly what we do in the polymerase chain reaction in all of our molecular biology. So we can take a uh, <clears throat> piece of DNA and say we want to look at these genes like we do for the ribosomal RNA. We make a primer to that. In other words, we make a, uh, a sequence of those bases for that gene, add it to this reaction mixture, and add all the nucleotide bases and then uh, uh, through a, a, a cycle of, of hot and cold along with an enzyme we could actually make m multiple copies of DNA. So what, he's, what he has done is the requirement for cycling between low and high temperature for nucleic acid copying and strand separation again strongly suggests that he's, he's also pointing out that this generally only occurs in fresh water and cold environments, but he's, in this latest experiment he's found that uh, because it requires a heat system that locally heated by geothermal activity as a volcanic region would be ideal incubation for life to get this recycling going. So what he'd want is something that is, goes from hot to cold. So it's exactly what we do in the polymerase chain reaction. So that Shostak now, and now Dave Deemer, as a result of this work, now actually think that volcanoes may actually be important in the origin of life, what they didn't before. So what is known so far about encapsulation models is that these small lipid membrane structures probably are easy to make and, and may have been a, a very early stage in the origin of life. Uh, the lipid membrane structures can self-replicate, as I showed you that Jack Shostak showed. And the membrane structures, when exposed to a wet-dry cycle, can entrap macromolecules like nucleic acids and proteins. And when they're entrapped in these membranes, they can divide if exposed to high and low temperature cycles, again, just like the polymerase chain reaction. What hasn't happened yet, what Jack hasn't done yet, is actually synthesize nucleic acids in these, in these capsules. I think that's the next step, is he's going to try uh, to, get, to get synthesis going on. So, let me see, uh, how much time do I have? Do I have? Ten minutes, okay. So I'll go on to the uh, next subject, which is proto-metabolism, I'm calling it. So we, we've now talked about the RNA world and the synthesis of organic compounds, but this is a metabolism first. It's really a proto-metabolism. And it's based on the need for high concentrations of organic compounds that are the core of macromolecules, like purines, pyrimidines, amino acids. <coughs> 
<clears throat> what we want to do is generate catalytic organic compounds, but we also need something else. And one of the keys to this is to try to come up with a lot of high uh, energy chemical organic bonds. And the thioesters are the, the leaders. And that, again, I mentioned to you as a carbon sulfur bond to drive even more complex reactions. And <clears throat> so, for example, the big question is, can you get this sort of proto-metabolism going in a soup? And apparently not. I mean, and this is some work has been done, and, and I'm using the, the word spar sparseness, which is really coming from uh, three papers that Shelley Copley and her uh, colleague, Shelley is at the University of Colorado and, and is a biochemist. Uh, so sparseness, they believe, is a hallmark characteristic of metabolism. So it turns out, and they looked at an organism, Aquafex, that is a chemolithotroph, or chemolithoautotroph, we call them. It fixes CO2 uh, using hydrogen, but it also grows in oxygen, utilizes ammonia, and grows at 95. That's all that's required. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a really interesting piece of work that has looked at all the small molecules, less than 160 Daltons, which make up everything that the cell has. There's only 162 of them in this cell. That's it, the total uh, number of, of organic material. And <clears throat> if you look at all possible small organic molecules with carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen with a molecular weight of less than 160 Daltons, there's over 14 million of them. And that doesn't count a lot of the aromatic and uh, you know, heterocyclic, more complex compounds. So this, this is one of the reasons why the model for sparseness comes up, is the more you increase the diversity of your organic material in the soup, the less chance you actually have of doing something informative with what you have. So, and this is not a, 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 a new idea. Christian de Duve is a Nobel laureate uh, and, and that did some very interesting work in biochemistry and wrote a paper back in 1991 called The Thioester World. And I mentioned acetyl-CoA is a thioester. In other words, it's a, it's a carbon, oxygen, sulfur bond. Uh, so he mentioned the key to proto-metabolism is this thioester bond, which is high energy and it supports energy requiring reactions. So he incorporates this into uh, the making of essentially uh, uh, RNA and other, uh, and other compounds. So the requirement for both life and proto-metabolism are essentially the same. A sustained source of energy driven by chemical dis disequilibrium originating from either geological or sunlight and the presence of certain elements and particularly translation metals, etc. And this comes from uh, George Cody uh, on, on this and why proto-metabolism and the energy you know, coming from that is, is really important if you want to synthesize larger molecules. Going back to George Cody, this is a little bit uh, complicated. This is a pathway involved in this carbon sulfur type compound. It's the pathway that drives methanogenesis. It's the pathway that drives methanogens. And essentially what I want, want you to look at is these, these elements, virtually all the key steps from taking carbon dioxide all the way to methane, uh, go through a set of, of key enzymes that have iron, cobalt, nickel, and sulfur. And what's interesting is that some findings from the enzymes at the heart of this pathway, uh, for example, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase, acetyl-CoA synthetase that makes all this, all indications are that biochemists have determined that the metals and the metal sulfides do all the biochemical work. In other words, all the catalysis is at the, is at the metal site, not at the protein site. What the proteins do today basically is, uh, is create greater specificity in the activity, but not the catalytic activity. So this is, uh, as I say, a very, very important component of this is that 
you can actually have a pathway that many feel is the, probably the earliest metabolic pathway to emerge on Earth. It's a pathway that all the enzymes involved in it are oxygen sensitive, so it can only work in an oxygen negative environment. It relies very, very heavily on a lot of metals. Uh, and it's key organic, the key nitro, I mean, the key compound that has most of the, that generates most of the energy is this acetyl-CoA. And that's the name of the pathway. And just to show you from CO2 uh, to, to, to methane, uh, the, the various steps, uh, a lot of the key steps involve uh, uh, a variety of, of metals, selenium, tungsten, uh, iron sulfide, zinc, uh, cobalt, uh, iron, and nickel, or uh, manganese are all involved in these, this enzyme transition. This is the case of a pathway that just is shouting out to us that you know it, it, it evolved off of membranes. I mean, it evolved off of minerals, and so the presence of, of a sustaining chemistry generating system, uh, uh, many people think preceded RNA and, uh, 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 instruction and new evidence supporting some kind of proto-metabolic uh, is, has also come about. And this is a complicated piece of new evidence. And I, I, I'm, I'm sort of putting on my little biochemical head here, so I know this is really a stretch. But <clears throat> this is, I think, a, a very, very important paper. The first paper came out in 2007, and since then they've done some interesting models. And what they have done, uh, and I'll show you how they've done this, uh, the method that they use indicates that modern metabolism involving even proteins originated uh, in the metabolism of nucleotides. In other words, the, the first thing that the cells actually did when they became cells was to make the components of nucleic acids. Uh, <clears throat> and so it's essentially a uh, early metabolism. So the first enzymatic takeover of an ancient biochemistry or prebiotic chemistry involves processes related to the nucleotides for a world in which RNA was the only genetically encoded catalyst. Uh, and the way they did this, again as I pointed out, modern metabolism developed very early at the onset of protein discovery and it has and the way they did this is really phenomenal. I know this is complicated, but I didn't know this at the time I read this paper. I didn't realize that of all the proteins that we have, they undergo more than a thousand folds. There's more than a thousand different folds that proteins can go into. And what they've done through a lot, and they also point out here that the protein structure is actually much more highly conserved across the diversity of life than either sequence, like we do in RNA, or function. So a phylogenetic tree of all known protein folds, they have constructed, and it, it is apparently one of the most robust ideas of what is, what is primitive. This is what a protein looks like, and a, and a P-loop, we would call that, and this is one of the ancient folds. What they have done with some really clever work that I you know, want to go through, is they've identified nine folds of proteins that are very ancient. And they've used a, a lot of, of ways to do this. And so, a student that worked with me, Aaron Goldman, uh, decided that let's use this same kind of information and see what we can come up with about the RNA world. And just as a depiction uh, we don't know how these things are synthesized, but our idea of the early RNA world is some kind of informational RNA that could replicate itself. Uh, so you have a functional RNA and an informational RNA. And that went through some kind of translation where it eventually started making proteins. So this is the actual RNA protein world. Probably the first living organism looked like this. And then eventually uh, DNA took over. So what Aaron did is look at, I mentioned to you that there's over 50 proteins associated with the ribosome. And there's several really key proteins, including one called the elongation factor protein, very much involved in development of, of the length of peptides. And using the model from uh, the people that I showed you, uh, what he did is take a look at these pro, uh, 
these RNAs, for example, from ribosome, transfer RNA, which is what brings the, uh, uh, transfer RNA brings the amino acid to the side of the ribosome, uh, various key uh, proteins. And based on the models, uh, if the folds fold within, uh, you know, this sort of out to 19% or so, uh, these are proteins that developed in the RNA world. And then uh, these are proteins that developed in the last common universal ancestor and then proteins that are in modern biology. And you notice this is the total proteins that most of them have developed in modern biology. But if you look down here in the under 20%, which is in the RNA world, these contain the proteins that are essential to the ribosome. So uh, this is a paper that when it uh, came out, it basically states with, I, I think, a, a, a really interesting data set that the RNA world uh, was essentially alive. Uh, it had ribosomes, it, it, it translated into protein, it does everything that the DNA world has and that a wide range of proteins developed in modern biology. And in fact, many of these proteins that are involved in, in modern biology are domain specific. You don't even find them across domains. The interesting thing here is that these proteins that are found on the ribosome are conserved across all three domains. So the conclusion from the Goldman et al. is that a functional ribosome existed during the RNA world. All the ribosome proteins tested had only the ancient nine protein folds. Most of the proteins used by extant life evolved during and after the separation of the three domains of life. So I know that was a kind of a complicated data set, but I couldn't help showing you what one of my graduate students was doing on this. It's a huge bioinformatics thing, and it reminds me of talking to some of the students here who spend a whole year just in front of their computers. This work took more than a year in front of a computer to, to actually do, if you think about the, the kind of data that was involved. So, should we end? Yeah. Okay, so I'll tar start uh, tomorrow, what is the origin of the metal-dependent metabolic pathways? And, and talk about how those are synthesized. That's, that's a really good question, and it's one that, 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 that we hear quite a bit about, is that a couple of things is the ease in which you can actually get a double-stranded DNA. In RNA, it tends to fold almost like proteins. As you make the RNA, it will fold into sometimes uh, uh, configurations that you can't do anything with. But secondly, as a result of, you know, the folding and the, uh, the twisting that a double-stranded DNA can have, you can actually have very long lengths. That, so in an RNA world, and we'll talk about it later, I think the RNA world was actually, uh, uh, had limited a nucleic acid potential. So there's something I call uh, pre-cell community, where you actually had uh, lots of little minimal cells that had uh, a little bit of genetic information with RNA, but together they formed a community that acted like a cell, sort of a multicellular aspect of it. So d DNA really allows you to do a lot of things that, that, that you couldn't do. Uh, build a, a large chromosome and, and actually keep it from folding into nonsense. Yeah. Uh, concerning the process of encapsulation of RNA, uh, favored by uh, sites of wet and dry phases. Is there any chance that this or a similar process is, work, is at work in hydrothermal events? It's a good question too, and it's, uh, I've, I've been asked a lot about, particularly when I talk about uh, the, the origin of life, potentially events or various steps, and this is still going on. The problem is there's life there. Life doesn't allow any of this stuff to happen because it eats it. And so while it may still have the potential, you know, if, if we can remove all life from it, we, we might be able to see some really interesting things. But because life is everywhere, 
it just consumes things. So it really muddles up whatever experiment could have taken off. That's a really good question. And it's one that has led at least two labs that I know of to say, let's, let's make a hydrothermal vent in the lab so that we can actually do this kind of work in the lab. So. What you said about protein folding and how you can use that to say something about early life seemed really interesting, but I must admit that I'm not really sure if I was able to follow the reasoning behind that. So I was wondering if you could go over that briefly and perhaps also explain the axioms on the plots that you had. I wish I could go over it briefly. The model is really complicated and it's done by uh, the same authors and, and one of his postdocs, Wang. Um, to put it simply, what they have done is take a look at a wide, what, what proteins are found in all life forms, what proteins are found only in certain organisms, and <clears throat> take a look at those and see then uh, if the ones that are found, which ones are found in all life forms actually have these certain uh, uh, nine, nine folds. And they came up with the nine folds based on uh, both modeling and, and, and looking at uh, uh, what they thought would be the, the sort of early peptides that are formed and what the first folds would be, what would really early folds be, and came up with these, uh, <clears throat> these folds that uh, are something that are canonical to to uh, you know to certain to certain peptides other folds uh, aren't even present until you get really complicated proteins what we call multiple domain proteins that actually have lots of complication i mean i was I, I, again i admit i was blown away that there's over a thousand folds in proteins uh, that just took me by surprise uh, as soon as this came out but so they've, through their modeling, they've come up with these nine, these nine folds, and, and essentially all of, all of them are in uh, proteins that are essentially canonical proteins to all living organisms. And their first paper was that uh, certain key metabolic proteins that are found in, in every organism, because they're involved in the synthesis of nucleotides, are the ones that just are dominated by these folds. And that's why they came up with a conclusion that some form of metabolism involving proteins came even before the synthesis of RNA. So, which is kind of an interesting conclusion. Since then, they've really refined their model. And what Aaron did was actually take the model of separating uh, their model about what came out in the uh, RNA world versus LUCA versus uh, modern. And you know he used that. What was phenomenal, though, and when he did his analysis, we were going to work on just one protein, and it's a protein I'm going to talk about again, uh, because I think Jim stimulated me to talk about this. So he doesn't know this yet, but the the elongation factor protein on the ribosome uh, is one that was uh, isolated, and then through modeling came up with what they thought would be the sequence of the first of the elongation factor proteins that evolved. Now, elongation factor proteins are all ribosomes, and they're very much involved in, in uh, producing long chain peptides. And so what these people did is they came up with a, a, a protein sequence that was at the root of all the proteins that are elongation factor proteins. And they took that uh, made, made a gene to that and added it to E. coli. So E. coli can make hundreds of thousands of copies of it, of that gene protein for them. Took the protein out and found that its optimum temperature for working on the ribosome was 73 degrees Celsius. Now this was shocking when this happened because one of the authors is Steve Benner who always believed in a mesophilic origin or an origin around 30 or 40 degrees and he was Huh? Elongation factor protein, the earliest perhaps ribosome functioning at 73 degrees was the implication. And so it's that piece of work that stimulated us to go after not only the elongation factor protein, but all the other proteins in the, in the ribosome and see if in fact they were ancient and they are. <laughs>
I mean, they're, they're really, all indications are they're, they're very ancient proteins. But uh, I'll get back to, I don't know what, what you think about the, the right, uh, that work. I know this, but what's the first author's name? Uh, um, Gauche. Gauche. So there's two papers actually. Yeah, Gauche and Benner is the first, and then Gauche and non Benner is non the second. Benner. And the <coughs> paper I'm more familiar with is the second paper because they then uh, they they reconstruct these uh, elongation factors, and then they try to place dates on that. And then they make a plot where they plot the temperature, optimum growth temperature of the elongation factor and compare that to the temperatures derived, derived from oxygen isotopes. And they use that to argue that the Archean was hot, just like Paul Knauf likes it. And I, you know, I already said I don't think that's possible because there was glaciation. So the, the, here's, here's the point, however. There's, there's some couple of different things. And I think I'm, I'm really glad that you stated it this way because it's really important. There's one thing about talking about global temperature, about ocean temperature and atmosphere. It's another thing about talking about hot spots. Now, you can actually have the origin of the first microbial community occurring at 70 degrees, even though the overall ocean was 30 or 40 degrees. So the point is, we have to be careful when we when we we say, okay, all our models show an atmosphere and an ocean is such and such, uh, a temperature of being moderate, but we had all kinds of volcanic and hydrothermal activity in the subsurface. And if we assume that some of the earliest communities developed there, then yes, it could have been at 70, it could have been at 50, it could have been at 80. That's the part that, it, so his work may actually be true, but I agree the second paper uh, and I remember that curve. I actually have it. I might show that at one of these times. I'll show it. <laughs> yeah. So you can you can show it as a temperature curve, but he they generalize about it as being you know what the uh, you know what the overall environment is. And I argued right away at at, at that 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 may only indicate that uh, you know the earliest community uh, of, of microbes actually existed in some narrow environment that was actually hot, not necessarily a, a global ocean or anything. So that's, so anyway, it's a, it's a good question. Why do you infer that the temperature it has happen must be the, the, the optimum one? Perhaps there is just one way of doing something and the, this way is not optimal. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> could be, yeah. I don't really know how to answer that, yeah. I think it's time to, to stop. Just an announcement. The place for the bullying, you have to go down to the main road below the hotel.